from the um, Knowledge and Technology and Innovation Group in Wageningen University. And she, she did her MSS in Irrigation Engineering in Chapingo University. And her MC is in Agriculture and Bi Biosystems Engineering in the University of Arizona. So she changed the discipline for the PhD and I'm one, I'm, I'm lucky to be one of her supervisors. The other one is Connie and Case Lewis. And um, she's going to, intro to present here one of her three cases of study in relation with all this process of learning and what she calls that that are these, um, these uh, within the context of agricultural innovation system uh, processes like Masagro. So she has been using Masagro as a case study for understanding different aspects of agricultural innovation system. Um, she is very in looking on politics of knowledge in agricultural research and in the process that facilitates the inclusion and inclu exclusion in technology driven interventions. In some way or another, her main point of questioning is that technology, it's, uh, there's, there's this focus of determinist technology, determinism in technology, so how context is important for a technology to be successful. So in th this case, it's going to, she's going to talk about Masagro Mobile. Um, thanks, thank you, Tanya, for coming. for the introduction. It's my pleasure to be back here. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm not trained as a social scientist and I have became one as I learned here with the Masagro project. So part of the story, what I'm gonna tell you today um, relates to my own experience. When I first joined at CIMIT in 2012, I was working for Masagro Mobile. So, and that's actually what pushed me to move into the anthropological side because I had many questions as I was implementing this project. So, hold on a minute. Technology, technology, yes, right? Uh, wait, oh, let's use this. So, in agriculture, information and communication technologies have gained importance the last years, especially departing from the premise that information can empower you. What do we mean by information can empower you? Well, if you're a farmer and if you are renting machinery, if you uh, get weather forecast information, you would plan better your activities uh, based on the fact that probably it's gonna be raining tomorrow and if you rent it for tomorrow, well, you might not be able to use the machinery, right? That's what I mean by information is power and the assumption has been that by providing information to farmers, we can help them uh, to overcome poverty. So um, the mobile phones have been uh, one of the most used technologies among these ICTs for ag uh, interventions because the penetration rates are higher, but these interventions are usually contested. And they are contested because they have mixed outcomes. I was mentioning before information, but we also need technology, right? Sometimes they don't know, or the findings, or the literature does not know to what attribute the successes or failures. Is it the information itself, or is the technology we are using to take this information? Also, the outcomes are really, or are related to specific contexts. And then the question of whose goals, whose agendas, whose interests, why are we taking information to farmers? What do we wanna achieve? So as happens in many interventions, uh, and I say that also because of my natural science background, we tend to emphasize a lot the deterministic or the technology nature or just think in, in, in let's say, uh, in a deterministic way on the technology. But sometimes we lack to understand the context. In the case of ICTs for Ag, most of the people that has been implementing those interventions do not have an interdisciplinary or a social 
anthropological background, which is also important. And I will explain that as I tell you the story. So there are many documented experiences of why or, or fail, <coughs> failed or successful experiences. But something we don't reflect that often is how learning happens in these interventions. And that's important because if we want to improve or work, uh, or work as implementers, or in, uh, yeah, we need to gather all those lessons. And we also tend to undermine the sociopolitical nature of all this learning. And that's at the core or at the center of innovation systems in general. So to tell you this story, I'm going to take the case of Masagro Mobile, which is a, an SMS-based service that was launched in 2009. It, wa it was led by the Sagarpa. But with the uh, launching of Masagro in 2010, it was adopted as one of the tools uh, for the project in 2012. So I think all of you are familiar with the concept of HOP because you are familiar with Masagro project, right? Uh, to elaborate this story, I'm going to divide uh, Masagro Mobile into two, federal and a state, which is, relates to Guanajuato, and that depends on the funding. Federal depends on the funds of the Sagarpa at federal level, and Guanajuato from Guanajuato. So. How, look, how Masagro Mobile looks in 2018, or looked, because that's the last point I had to analyze all the data. So even though there's just one single channel for texting, let's call it this way, we can classify the information into two, weather forecast information and agronomic information. Weather forecast, well, it will give you the uh, max mean temperatures for five days, the uh, probability of rain for the five days. And in agronomic information, that relates to some tips that could help farmers or technicians to have a better management of the fields, but also uh, share events or activities related to the Masagro project. Okay. Uh, so this is more or less what I was describing, so it covers all the areas where Masagro project is being implemented. We have two general types of users, farmers and technicians. Uh, the frequency, it's at least once a week. And to subscribe, I heard Santiago mentioning some of the issues he had to subscribe to the system. Uh, you could do it uh, via your mobile phone or you could do it in the system or in one of these training events that Masagro holds sometimes. Um, yeah. So now it's free. But to come to that setup, uh, many things happen. So I'm telling you, or I'm, I'm going to describe a history of 10 years, OK? So how many people was using Masagro Mobile? I still don't have the figures of last year, but in 2017, there were like 32,000 uh, farmers using, or number of messages sent out, sorry. Uh, you will see, I won't elaborate in those numbers now, but you will see like shifts in those numbers and that's to say all the shifts or they are related to all the shifts that happen internally in the project, okay? And now let's go to the part of the long process of learning, right? So I'm gonna describe three services. Uh, agricultural information services, weather forecast services, and crop price services. And I start my story from here because that's when the encounter with Masagro in 2012 happened and that's how it used to operate, okay? So we saw many changes. I have decided to divide a Masagro mobile of its history in five phases. The first one, when it was only managed by the Sagarpa, the second, the encounter with Simit and Masagro. The third, fourth, and fifth are also related to Simit and Masagro. We can see changes in the vision of the project. By that I mean like when it was launched in 2012, 
It was meant to support farmers that were applying for a subsidy through the Ministry of Agriculture. So they could get an update on the status of the applications. They could also have access to crop information of all the crops available in the Mexican market. Weather forecast in the same way. Uh, in the second, the, in the second uh, phase, when it meets with Masagro, what happened is Masagro had been running already for two years, but they needed a tool, and they were thinking also in pushing or making farmers, small farmers, entrepreneurs. So they were talking about multi-stakeholder platforms. Let's create a platform, was the idea, where we have farmers, input dealers, buyers, scientists, technicians, Let's provide farmers with microfinancial services so they can improve their farmers and their lives. Sadly, we couldn't find people that wanted to invest in that project, and we had to change the vision again. And then it moved uh, to the ICTs for d uh, to help scaling up technologies and other processes in complementing this whole unit that Masagro project had. With each of these changes in the vision, leaders also changed. So in the beginning, we had a person that was uh, oriented on the technical side when it was from the Sagarpa. No studies were performed on why it was important to launch uh, crop prices or weather information, weather forecast information. In the second phase, we had someone that had this micro business vision. But when it, when it didn't work, we had to find a new leader. Someone came uh, with more a uh, computer science background, and that person was really happy to program behind the screen the messages. And the monitorings were uh, taken in a different phase or a different way. In this part, in the second part, we spent some time in the field. We were trying to find out farmers' needs, talking to farmers in the field directly. In this second part, because our background somehow shapes the way we work, this person was like, well, I can ask them uh, through um, survey uh, through the phone, how do, they, how do the farmers feel about the technology or this project? And in this fifth phase, I think people has learned to combine not only the monitorings in the field, but also using still these monitorings via phone. But it took some years and all these shiftings. Uh, then we see also changes in the platforms and the service numbers. I will elaborate on that later. But uh, what I want to tell you is that in the beginning, only the person programming the messages was reaching the user. The user was not able to reach us if they had an issue. So we needed to also improve the interaction with the user. And that meant we needed to look for other platforms that would facilitate that. But it wasn't easy to find. I think somehow they manage now with Extensium, but we see three different platforms. With these platforms, the number of registration also changed, and that also caused some kind of a problems with the users because the users were like, oh, is this a different project again? Or, you know, you lose some credibility in there. So we also changed the information. So in the beginning, I said here, we had crop price, uh, access to subsidies, or status of subsidies, weather forecast. Then uh, with CMIT, no more information about subsidies, but just wheat and maize, because those are the crops that are the scope of, mass of CMIT. And later on, at this point, we don't provide, or they don't provide crop information anymore. But there's an explanation for that. So, as I mentioned, I'm going to elaborate in three different services that have been part of the project. Let's start with weather forecast information. So in 2012, 2013 actually, I was really excited. The project was launched in 2012 and they, we were ready. We had many users registered, I think probably 9,000 by that time. And it was time to go to the field and see how Masagro Mobile was making a change on farmers' lives. We spent a week in the field, and I was really sad. So you can see my expression here, like the farmer really, like, I'm showing him this picture because I was telling him, have you ever heard of Masagro Mobile? He was like, what? 
Then I was like, but you're in my system. My system says you're a user. And then he was like, no. So I told him, have you ever seen this picture? I was like, no. Then it made me wonder, there's something wrong there then. What's happening? So after a week of field work, the last day, we were really sad. We were like, we've been working behind our computers, designing something that no one is using. Probably we should rethink what we're doing. And suddenly I met Hilda Hernandez. And Hilda told me, well, my technician came the other day and he showed me, or he told me I could access to information through a mobile phone. And I tried it. But when I tried it the first time, the system sent me a message back saying, your locality, your community does not exist. <laughs> then I was like, <laughs> but she was like, well, I thought, because I'm from a small community, probably I should try with a bigger community, my municipality. And then she typed in the municipality. And then she got information back. And then she was like, well, I got some numbers, like T max, T mean, percentage. I was like, I don't understand that message. What does that message mean? So she sent a message to her technician, and the technician told her, oh, well, it seems that tomorrow or tonight there's going to be a frost. And then she recalled, oh, I've been told that probably with irrigation I can help to reduce the effects of the frost. She was the canalera or the lady managing the pumps in the field. And then she was like, okay, I'm going to irrigate my fields. Two of them, let's see. Entre que son peras y manzanas, we say in Spanish. I'm not sure, but I will try. The next morning, she was surprised when she saw that her friends had lost their crops, and she didn't. And then she was like, oh, that information works. But then that makes us reflect on some of these issues. So what we realized is that the system was too sensible to a, the name of the locali localities. If for someone locally they know the community as Siene, that's how they call it, I'm going to go to Siene, and if I type that in the system, the system would say the information does not exist. So we realized that we needed to tell the farmers, you need to type the official names. But imagine, with all the farmers we had, how would you encourage them to like, use the official names? We needed to change that. We tried or we made emphasis in the trainings so technicians could uh, tell farmers, you know what, you should try to type the official names. Then, the quality of the message, the limitation of characters in the real that how reliable the information was. So with all the characters or the limitation to 163 characters, we couldn't provide all the detailed information that then Doña Hilda, for example, had to rely on her technician. And then we knew we also needed to inform farmers how we were calling her messages and make emphasis on that. We couldn't send more messages. There was a limitation of budget as well, so we need to work with what we had. What also happened is that the database that was providing the weather forecast information was free. We were not paying for it. But sometimes that would lead to some mistakes. So at one point we were requesting information of today and it was sending us information from the last week. But we couldn't come back to the provider because we were not paying him, right? Then the actionability of the information, Doña Hilda says, well, I was a canalera, but if I knew there was going to be a frost and I didn't have access to water, probably my story would be something different. So the information itself does not empower you. It also depends on the resources you have. I mentioned the different operation numbers we had, like trying to fix some of these issues, that at one point when we were talking to farmers, they were also saying, well, I was trained to use this number to register in this, and then the next year you're coming for an, with another number, and then with another number. I don't know if I can trust you. So, uh, yeah. So this is the funny one, because 
we know that sometimes we are really polite and we want to ask in a nice way, please, could you send me the information of this locality? But the system was, again, too sensible and then would send information not available. This problem was fixed or is fixed in the new version because now you don't have to type a message to request the information and instead your code phone is linked directly to a region and you get the information. So we, they, they solved, they solved. I'm not part of the project anymore. They solved that problem, but it took some years. So if you see all these failures as a user and you have to pay for it, then you get disappointed. Why should I pay for something that it's not giving me information or that I could use? Again, the limitation we had through all the history of the project was the donors. Luckily, in this last version, the service is free. But that also uh, depended on finding a donor that was willing to invest on the project. We also realized that we had a diversity of contexts and realities. Whereas in the north side of Mexico, we have farmers that think that an SMS is quite old fashioned because they love apps and mobile phones. In the south part of Mexico, there's people that prefer voice-based messages because avoids a lot of problems. But also, if you don't have mobile phone coverage, then you have to look for another alternative, right? Um, another issue that we need to add to this is that in Mexico, the official language is, is Spanish, but we have 68 different indigenous groups that do not speak Spanish. We tried to fix that at one point uh, in a collaboration with the Gays Foundation, but then we had different scoping areas and that couldn't happen because someone had to pay for the project and money was a limitation in that. So uh, that's what I mentioned. So at one point we tried to um, fix many of these issues collaborating with other institutions, Mexican institutions, but it was hard to really agree. Who's gonna pay? But also what happens in the Mexican landscape, every time we have elections, there are changes in leaders. If it, take you, if it took you some time to convince someone to work with you, if there's a political change and there's a new person coming, agendas change and you have to start again. So now let's go to the crop price service. Many of the experiences are pretty similar to the weather forecast information, but here there's another interesting one. Actionability of the information and empowerment. I started the presentation saying information can empower you and that's the premise that this ICT for the interventions use. Well, we were giving information to farmers and the farmers were disappointed. So what? You give me the price, but I cannot negotiate. And actually, some of the farmers started to be mad that at one point, even though monopolies are not legal in Mexico, we were asked to stop providing the, crop, the price of one of the crops. So then information, is it really free? No. There's also uh, people with more power controlling who can access to that information. This issue was also somehow fixed in the version of Guanajuato because then uh, there was a closer agreement with the Ministry of Agriculture and crop prices were readjusted in the region and they were, farmers were told, if you want this to be respected, you have to have crop insurance. Otherwise, it's not gonna work. But that comes also with training and with all the um, alliances there. In 2018, uh, they are not providing crop information anymore. Now let's go to the agronomic information services. Um, well, they realized that feeding all the different types of users was challenging. Even within one community, we know it. Farmers are not the same. And one of the main problems here is like we need to create information that fits different types of users and profiles and the resources they have. 
Mm, so the registration to this channel was kind of hard. For example, in, the, in 2009, it was about the subsidies, so they only had to type the number of the application. In 2012, when we had this micro-business vision, meant we had 30 profiles, and farmers had to register user and hub, and that made it complex, and we came to make a infographies for each user, for each profile, but it still was challenging. Then we reduced to 12 users, and for Guanajuato, that was sorted out later, because farmers would complain that, well, you're giving me information. I'm from Oaxaca, but I'm from the mountains, and you're giving information that is useful for someone in the valley. Well, it's not working, right? For Guanajuato, that was later fixed because they were able to make smaller or regionalize the state into smaller regions. In 2016, that's better because um, with the codes of the phones, let's say you want to reach all the farmers of Michoacan that are cropping maize under irrigated uh, regime. You can do that because that's linked now to the Bitácora Electrónica, electronic field notebook, and you can do that. Conflicts of interest over naming products because the project operates with public funds. If you are recommending the use of a chemical, you cannot promote the commercial name because then you're favoring or you're accused of favoring some private companies over others that you have to send the farmers the chemical or the generic name, the formula, and then the farmers is like, really? What's, what's the language you're speaking to me to? Um, but then that also comes with the help of the technician, which helps, or we can call it chemical literacy that technicians have been doing a work on that. So with all the experiences I mentioned, well, people were somehow disappointed in saying, well, is this really working or not? We needed, to, or they needed to convince the team members within Masagro, but also outside, that this could work. And one way of doing that, it's asking them to help in the creation of information. For example, in 2016, I was happy to see that some of the technicians were like, yeah, and I sent information to my technicians through that tool, and they find it interesting, or farmers would say, yes, I got an invitation to a specific event to be trained in a topic, and I'm happy with that. So, just to move to the conclusions, well, in ICTs for this, for D, as in many other interventions in agriculture, we need to move beyond the technical issues. We need to understand better the local context. We don't recognize the political nature of our work as implementers. But I was showing to you that Masagro Mobile had to, sh to change the narratives and discourses, the visions. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been able to continue. If you don't embrace new narratives and discourses or feed your work where your donors can provide this support, then you won't be able to continue your work. Something that we don't value that much, I think, it's how learning take, takes place. And we need to work more on that. Documenting how do we implement things, uh, projects, but also create an institutional memory for that. I was mentioning several leaders' changes, and I was also surprised to see that people was starting, not from zero, but not departing from all the information that was already gathered. So there was no a good transition among the uh, team members of the project. And as I mentioned, or linked to uh, the, the first point is that we need to recognize the sub-political sub dimension of learning and why some lessons can be taken and not. This story I find fascinating because even if we have learned that we need to make changes, we are prevented of making these changes sometimes for the sociopolitical socio nature of the landscape. So it's not only about willing to, but also how we manage or move in some contexts. 
and well, I repeated the last point, but learning is not an individual process. We learn from others. And that's, that was also a personal learning experience for myself. That's it. Um, so thanks, Tania, for the presentation. So now we open the door, the, the space for questions. Let's try to use the microphone that there's people listening in the, by internet. You want to start? Yeah, of course. Uh, one thing on the price, it's, it's sad that it's discontinued and I really don't understand because in other places market prices are really important and probably the most valuable information for farmers. Uh, think about West Africa. When you have imperfect markets, you can have large price differences on different markets and providing timely and geospecific market prices can be very useful for farmers. That's the point one. The second one is, I mean, some of those things, it seems like some of those products have been under design and not looking at the demand side. So the learning has been done by implementing something that could have maybe be diagnosed as poorly designed from an ex ante side. So your yeah. view on that. Yeah, I, I really I want to elaborate mainly on your second point. So um, when Masagro undertook this Masagro model that the Sagarpa had, it was also because the main donor was the Sagarpa. So we don't recognize that the donors somehow drive the way we implement the work. So, and we had to, it was kind of frustrating because we had to take all the, I don't want to call them mistakes, but all the assumptions or the bad assumptions we had when this project was running, and we had to try to fix that. So I think there was a lot of frustration within the team at the beginning because probably it was better to start from zero than trying to fix something that was already running. So there was, yeah. Average prices, and that was one of the problems as well, because farmers were like, well, we saw them on the TV, but why is that they cannot yeah. buy us at this well, price? Mm -hmm. Information of global events, basically, to all the monitoring of the and Olaf. Thank you. Seminar, Tanya. Thank you very much. Um, just hatching on to that one and your conclusion around um, we need to understand better the socio-political dimensions and how they influence things. Can you make a connection between socio-political di dimensions, be it in Mexico or in the project setup and team, with what Bruno was just mentioning, this thing about understanding well beforehand what's needed and also even things like prices and why that was taken away? Okay, I think I'm going to start first with the second one, then I'm going to have to think to the first one. Um, why that was taking? I don't think there was like an official response, but we, uh, so I think we could ask the leader of Masagro probably, but he's not here, but he has a better answer for that. <laughs> uh, but I think farmers started to complain and as I said, monopolies are not allowed in Mexico legally, but we know that there are some monopolies on who uh, buys most of some specific crops in Mexico and they control the market prices. So I, don't, I think we had the best intentions, but we didn't, um, we didn't understand the complexity of giving that information to farmers. And going back to your question of the sociopolitical dimensions, hmm, that's interesting. I don't know, Carolina, would you like to elaborate on that or help me? I'm gonna pass it to Carolina. <laughs> what you just said, in a larger context, looking at it, the whole sociopolitical issues around, can you, can you not mention 
prices, who gets upset, who doesn't get upset, who has the stronger voices in all this. And yeah, it's part of the sociopolitical dimension, actually, um, in, in some ways that influence. Perhaps following up about the planning that you were saying also, uh, I think that Tanya has been repeat, saying something that we normally talk about, that when you start a project, you start with a lot of assumptions. So we have to recognize, and we are not very self-reflective of those assumptions, no? And in some way or another, there's assumptions for everywhere. That we, can, we can accuse that um, technological determinism has this big assumption that technology by itself will drive in change but also agriculture innovation system approach has this assumption that everybody will sit in the table and it will be a nice conversation. No? It's, we call it the, the happy wor Dutch word, no? that they are assuming that negotiation will be very nice. <laughs> but at the end, if, if you, uh, well, sorry for the Dutch. <laughs> 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 but the truth is that when, when they tried this about uh, small scale farmers, business models and everything, they didn't have financial support for that. So we, we tend to um, underlook uh, on our assumptions about how things will work and the contextual nature of how they can move forward. And in that sense, yes, there's, uh, we can, you can claim, well, come on. It was so obvious that you have to put all the stakeholders together to negotiate, but the truth is that you, everything has its project trajectories, and sometimes you can do that, but for doing that, you have to prepare yourself. And, and that's the beauty of the learning processes, that the learning processes can tell you when is the correct moment for doing that. Yeah, thanks for your uh, presentation. I, I mean, you made the uh, descriptive account of, of the history of, of, the, of the whole program, but in, in your table about the users, I wasn't quite clear. I mean, you had data not available or discontinued. I mean, yes. you better clarify, is it, well, what is it? Because it, it wasn't clear if the program was discontinued or the users, it no longer exists, it does not exist. So and then again, there is users in the subsequent year, so I mean, it's not yeah, very... Yeah, 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 I get your point. So I was telling you in the beginning, so when the project was launched, it was only Masagro Federal. So that's why we have this site. Um, there was no Masagro Guanajuato. And there's no data because when I was talking to the people, to the Sagarpa, they were not monitoring the tool. I think they were speaking to farmers sometimes, but there was not a systematization of the whole process. When we started to do some monitoring and systematization here, so we took the uses that were already part of this project in Sagarpa. So they were going up, up, up. In 2014, we had the maximum number of users. But in 2015 and 16, there was the change of a new, to a new platform, a SOFO. And then we realized that we had many numbers registered and people here in Mexico also changed SIM cards with all the discontinuity of farmers on the history of Masagro on how different programs have joined the project and then left. That comes with farmers joining and leaving the project. So they cleaned all the information here somehow and that's why it, when it goes down again. Because we were probably, or they were probably sending messages to users that were not part of Masagro anymore. So. Uh, for example, 146 to 121, what? Messages? Uh, to 436 people? Is so those are number of SMS, so messages. Yeah. So if you go to uh, that one, 146, uh -huh. yeah. Those are and messages. That's the number of SMS that we deliver to 3,000 users. Uh, to, the, to the right, so 3,436 users. Yeah, uh, yes, yeah, sorry, I think I, I made a mistake here. So, no, 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 this is for Masagro Guanajuato. No, no users of Masagro Guanajuato are it's on the right. Yeah. 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 So you use ah, yes, yes, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Over 100,000 messages to 3,000 people, that's what it is? Yes, yes, somehow. 
Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, the point is, you, it would be good to clarify a bit this table. I mean, no data is no data, that's clear, but it no longer exists, and then it comes into existence again in 2017 and 2018. Does it exist? Does it not exist? I mean, it's a bit... So they, uh, they stopped, or it's not like it, yeah. So I was explaining that they had to register, to use weather forecast service, they had to register location, municipality. For crop service, they had to register the crop or request the crop. But at one point, they were not providing this information and they were just sending out agricultural information because we had struggles on the quality of the data. So sometimes it was better to stop it if it was not okay. good enough. Thanks. The other point was, I mean, listening to your story, yeah, it, it's quite descriptive but also quite critical of yeah, basically you're highlighting all the flaws of things that didn't work of a rather supply-driven model. Having been involved directly, yeah, have you not tried any, any adaptations in terms of making that feedback loop, in terms of really maybe segmenting the market or the users? And I mean, you basically list a number of problems, but what I lack is kind of, okay, how do we actually make it work, useful yeah, instead of just saying it doesn't quite work or didn't quite deliver what we anticipated. I, I don't think my main message is it's, it's not working, but what I wanna say is that I see that they have learned through the time. And one of the things they've been doing is improving or trying to, yeah, to improve the monitoring process because it wasn't really clear how they were gathering all these lessons. No monitoring at this stage, monitoring in the field directly at this stage through phone calls at this stage. And here, they, what I've been talking, or this paper has been developed closely with the implementers of the project at this stage. And we comment on the lessons or what happened, or they also recognize that they didn't know that all these shifts happened, or all the attempts we had, or the other people had, in making this service work better. So now, for example, they are um, aiming to use WhatsApp groups in some regions, just as one of the improvements, because that fits a specific type of users in the north side of Mexico. Uh, they are thinking in putting back the crop information, but only in Guanajuato, because that's where it seems it worked better. Uh, yeah, so I, I don't think I make it, made it evident here, but yes, I've been talking to them. It's always very dangerous to show numbers at CIMIT, but uh, yeah, I know. That, that's, a, that's another thing. Um, I mean, this is one project that, that uses mobile uh, or, or mobile information, right? There are thousands of projects, and I think the last decade it was a big hype. And I think now we're a bit in anti-hype, right? This is one example where we are allowed to be more critical about it, right? And I think that's good. How do you see the future of these kind of things? Um, I mean, there's a lot of discussion, information is not action, right? And I think in the kind of projects that have, the problems have been that people measure, okay, how many SMS were re uh, sent, you know, this is information, this doesn't mean action, no? Yes. Do you, you must have, do you have some ideas about how that gap between information and action and basically the waking up of the, of the world on this, how do, how do you see this? How do you see the next 10 years? Or do you see that, where, where do you see the, 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 the point where it levels off? Yeah. I think we've been working with these ICTs for the interventions in the last 40, 50 years, and we're trying to reinvent it all the time. I think it has some potential. Uh, I think Bruno, Bruno was citing some experiences in Africa. It's really, the problem is like, it's really a context dependent. But just entering on the, something I like about this project, for example, now they are creating, or they, they've been trying to create a repository of information the, 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 mes the messages they are sending to farmers, like the information, creating information is also a challenge and it requires many years. So I think rather than saying these interventions do not work or they do work, it's how we are incorporating all these lessons or these learning lessons. So the creation of the repository to me, I think is one of the most uh, valuable things within a mass agro mobile, and it took them some years. And that helps not only farmers, but also policymakers, 
if you are trying to create scenarios, which I think, I think economists love doing as well, because now it's linked to the Bitácora Electrónica that also gathers information from different fields. So I think it requires combining different tools and approaches. It's, it, it shouldn't be only focused on a single technology, but you have to combine different tools. How far is it from the How far? Ah, that's a challenging question. <laughs> mm. I think it still needs more work, and yeah, but I don't know. Masagro ends, I think, next year. I don't know if it's gonna continue, and I think one of the challenges here is also the funding, because even if you have really great ideas and you wanna incorporate lessons, if there's no one willing to invest in your projects, incorporating these lessons, it's gonna be challenging. Hi. Hi, I am Diana Popa from Extensio, former ah. Soco. So I think I can help Tanya with some of the uh, some of the questions that have been asked here. Um, so just to give you a, an overview from our side of what we have done since uh, taking over the project with Andrea Garda Sabal in 2017, the first thing we have done was to uh, clean the database because with the, all the changes of management of the projects in the years before. Well, as you can, could see in the, in the figure uh, table, um, there was poor monitoring of the messages that were sent, of the users that, was, that were um, receiving the information and how useful that information was to them and how interested they were to receive that information. So the first thing we did was only keep in the database the user that had uh, expressed interest to continue with the service and then start to uh, cross the Massagro mobile database with uh, the Bitacora Electronica, with uh, the databases from CIMIT. And we have reached uh, in 2018, end of 2018, now we have 13,000 uh, um, common users in the master database, of which in 2018 only 6,500 have received SMSs because we have made with Andrea a choice of only sending information to the southern states uh, for budgetary purpose. Instead of sending information to everybody, but with a limited budget, uh, just have like one SMS a week, which was not enough to cover um, weather information, to cover uh, agricultural information. Uh, we chose to send SMSs to the smaller farmers, to the states that more needed that information. And then starting 2019, we are looking at ways through WhatsApp, through new technologies that are a most more cost effective to cover effectively the whole territory and integrate new projects. A second thing we did with Andrea was to focus the program on maize only. And um, the reason why the prices were not um, continued from, I don't know about 2015, 2016, but 2017 was also because of quality. Uh, so in terms of information, we focused first on the weather information because before the weather information was sent at, if I remember correctly, municipal level, mm -hmm. and it was not enough, it was not precise enough for the farmers. So we sent it at locality level. Uh, so that was the first thing. The second was to focus on the actionability of the agricultural information. And for this, we have worked with the research department as Mrs. Camacho knows. Uh, we have worked with the hubs in order to develop a catalog of SMSs for maize that is now being um, continually assessed with the farmers and actualized year by year. And starting this year, yes, we have with Andrea the strategy to reintegrate prices. Uh, we still need to make sure this is actionable and the prices are uh, relevant for the farmers. I'm very interested in price, though I'm not an economist, but. You mentioned, you mentioned the two-way communication and the potential of crowdsourcing. I think market prices are really, really a good example where you can increase a lot the granularity both in terms of space and time in terms of market prices. Uh, have you thought about that? Um, I think you are right. We apply the crowdsourcing not to prices, but we applied it to pests, for example, this year. Um, asking, so sending during October and November to the farmers 
uh, the symptoms of the pests that were uh, most risky in that period of time and asking them to answer yes, only yes, a very short answer, in order to map and to, uh, we piloted it in Guanajuato and to send to Eric the information. So I think it's a good idea to, to use it also for prices. Yeah, you're right. And this is what I think the, the importance of, of this kind of projects is that if they are managed correctly and you know with a continuous management and with a clear vision, it gives us this potential of crowdsourcing. It gives us this potential to connect to 13,000 farmers in the territory and not only send them information, but also monitor, also see what kind of uh, good practices work on the field, what works for them, what doesn't work, and what information they have from the field. Yeah. And uh, just the last thing, I think this is new information for Tanya as well. Um, we do believe that there is a way for the farmer to pay for the service at one point. I think this program should, should not be uh, donor um, dependent. Uh, but I think we, we have to ask to the farmer, farmer to pay in the moment when we are sure of the quality of what we deliver. And I think this is key. Um, and we have projects like with other NGOs that um, where we see that farmers start to be interested in paying for the service. So I think it's something that can also be implemented little by little in, in Masagro, <laughs> now that the quality is here and uh, now that we know what we deliver to the farmers. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, I don't know if there's another question. I didn't see anybody raising the hand. Yeah. Just, just to follow up on this last one. So the pests. So how are you validating the responses coming back from the farmers? So you know they're just pressing yes, no. So if you turned around the order of the questions, would you see a shift, or or are you doing any validation? Sure, but how how valid is the yes and how valid is the no? We're evaluating it with uh, the technical team from Guanajuato because what we did was send them the coordinates of the farmers that answered so they can attend them directly. And we are now seeing what they have seen and we're in the evaluation. Um, the report will be sent uh, beginning of February and I think Andrea can can share it, yeah. And because it's something that we would look, want to go, I mean, it's, it's a first attempt. There will sure be a lot of learnings from this, but I th we think it's something that we should look into making better and scaling it. Yeah. So it would be, really, be really helpful to have feedback on the report. Okay. Anybody else for questions or we are, well, we're accurate on time. We've heard it a lot in your presentation, and we hear it just now from Deanna. This idea of trial by or trying something and seeing if it works, and the, you, you see it along the long sort of timelines and all the sort of experiences you, you, you presented. I guess my question is how much of, of what was learned could have been anticipated? Um, <laughs> what is it that... Um, has to change for these projects to be more effective? And I'm, I mean, I'm sure there's still quite a bit of things that we couldn't have anticipated, um, but listening to, you know, it, it's obvious if we're presenting, say, wholesale prices to farmers in Mexico City, and, this, and we're talking about, they're looking at, they're interested in farm gate prices and somewhere in a village in Oaxaca, you're gonna have problems if farmers aren't trained to know how to interpret the data and, and use it as a reference price. But, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. There seems to be a lot of stuff we could have anticipated, and I guess it, you must have reflected on this too. Yeah, I think y you're right. Um, I think something we learned, and Diana can tell you more about that, is that they, it's important to pilot many times before you launch something. Somehow, the problem we had with Masagro Mobile is that it was running at national level, and we didn't question the first assumptions that the Sagarpa did when it started or launched the project. And I think that's something CIMI should have done. We need to see what are the assumptions, why this information, what users. So yes, we could have anticipated, could have anticipated that. But I think also, Diana, I th it sh uh, you pilot many of the... Uh, yeah. Yeah. 
Well, I think also a, I was mentioning the different ways of doing the monitoring. When I was doing the field work in 2016, the person that was in charge before it, he was doing monitoring via phone or a computer service, whatever. And then we took him to the field and he was really happy and said, I never thought I could learn so much from interaction with farmers. So it's a continuous learning process. I don't think we have like secret, secret recipes for how to do it right, but we learn as we go. Yeah. Throwing into to what the Jason is saying, I mean, the concept of if you're going to fail, fail fast and fail forward. Yes, that's true. <laughs> there's, there's another question, comment? too short time to discuss that. I think it's a very interesting topic, a very important topic, a very complex topic. And I think, again, discussing it more would probably be designing better in the future than I. I would suggest, for example, to Leonard just to organize a one-day workshop on uh, information <laughs> communication technologies <laughs> and, and, and just look at. <laughs> so because. I'm sure that you felt alone when you were working in Massacre Mobile and you didn't get, you know, I mean, you, you, you were running with the ball. But I think sometimes it's good time to time just to discuss those things in a, in a much deeper fashion uh, and, and learn from other places as well. I think as a lot of people have worked in Africa with information and communication technologies. We have some sad experience in Asia as well. I mean, CSAT. Uh, um, uh, SMS system where in fact farmers were asking to unsubscribe because they were just bothered by the, the number of SMS they were getting. Uh, and, and I think we can do much better uh, in, in that, having, you know, co-designing those systems with more the demand and, and the actionable information in, 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 our, in, in, in our view. So, yeah. But very good, huh? That's uh, it's very important. Okay, that's, that's the final part. I will use what um, um, Bruno says for saying that I think that uh, as CIMIT we have really, really to work hard in our institutional learning processes and in, in our institutional memory for being able to do this fast learning. Thank you for your participation. Your assistant.